hopefully at this point on Periscope, Twitch, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all of that great stuff. And uh, we are joined this morning. My name is Patrick. I work on the social media team. We're joined this morning by uh, just an incredible human being here that's going to tell us all about Plankton. We've got Jane here. Jane, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Patrick. I am so excited to join you this morning and share with everyone my passion, which is Plankton. Yeah, Plankton. And so with that, Jane, I'm going to switch over here to our feed where we're down in the lower right corner and we have here on the screen Woo. some absolutely incredible animal life from the Monterey Bay. So tell us, who do we have right here on the screen there on that, on this that left side? This is so exciting. And we have a photo bomber driving <laughs> through, coming through. And what we have in the main screen is the copepod. And this copepod is very different from what you might have heard on, you know, SpongeBob, uh, you know, the yeah. evil Evil character. plankton. Yeah, so don't, uh, anyone out there who's tuning into the live stream, make sure not to give this particular organism here. Don't have any secrets of the Krabby Patty formula here <laughs> on the stream. We do not want that. Uh, that's what plankton is looking for in SpongeBob. But plank uh, and this plankton and SpongeBob, like you said, is a copepod, which we have right here. Yes, we sure do. So it's so cool. We um, renovated this tiny drifters lab um, about a year and a half ago. And so now our aquarist, Ellen, goes out collecting and she has two nets that she tows behind her boat. And what she got because she went out at night um, are these wonderful copepods. I'll see if I can find one that is a little bit more active. See if we can move them around. The one. Now, I just um, want to point out while you're doing this, Jane, that you are a master at finding the plankton. Uh, we yeah. have on the screen a little bit of that magnification there. So on the lower left, you can see the size that we're looking at. So mm -hmm. right now, that little mark there, that's half a millimeter, and we're zoomed in 17.3x to what it actually is. So uh, just to give you a sense of scale that we're looking at right there. And so w as we move, as Jane moves the table, even just a millimeter, it's like moving an entire world for this animal. There, Absolutely. So. These are one of the most numerous animals on planet Earth in terms of multicellular. And you can see on the screen, you can see its red eye. That is how you identify these little crustaceans. They are actually relatives of the crab and shrimp, as you might uh, see by the uh, long antenna and the little jointed parts. But they are really, really important as food for everything that we know and love in the oceans. They eat the phytoplankton. That's awesome. Jane, we have some questions here from the chat. Uh, one of the questions that we have there from Olivia Pinnell over on YouTube is are they closer to the surface at night, these copepods that we see there? Oh, you're smart. Yes, yeah. they are closer to the surface at night. They go through one of the, actually it is in terms of biomass, the largest migration on planet Earth, where at night they're close to the surface, feeding on the billions of diatoms and other phytoplankton. And then they sink down, down, down to 800 or so feet is some places way deeper than that and so that's to avoid predators we think right <laughs> so we have there that copepod there on the screen uh buenos dias a todos from uh josefina there buenos dias to maria as well oh <laughs> we've, we've got a little photo bomber that came in to take a look there um so we, we have folks that are tuning in from all around. We have uh, Edward Seidel saying, go Jane Silverstein. Oh, yeah, awesome. Hi, um, we have folks tuning in from Texas, from uh, lots of different areas. Let's see. Um, we have a question on Periscope, Jane. Ryan Marquez is wondering, do we grow any of ah. these plankton here at the aquarium for our other animals? That's a great Ooh, question. Great question, Ryan. And Patrick knows this too, mm -hmm. but we do grow all the jellies that we have on display, we actually grow behind the scenes. If you go behind any of our exhibits, you'll see lots of aquariums, lots of chrysals, mm -hmm. circular water flow tanks. We also grow all the food, the tiny little phytoplankton, tiny little zooplankton, animal plankton for the animals. Right, so yeah, but these plankton that we have here, these are from the wild Monterey Bay, and these are organisms that 
if you are out looking at the water, you're looking at hundreds and thousands of them, depending on the depending on the year, in just a small little area, but almost imperceptible to the human eye unless you really focus in really close, right? There's this microcosmos that these animals are in. I think that's why I love plankton so much is that it's a hidden mystery, a hidden beauty that you look at seawater, you can even dive in seawater and you don't see it. Patrick is an amazing underwater photographer. Oh, no, 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 no. And, <laughs> you know, you, even with his photography, you can't see plankton. You need a microscope for it. And so, um, and there's such diversity. It's incredible. Mm. And speaking of diversity, Jane, uh, we can maybe give the copepods away, uh, some time away from the limelight and switch yes. over to some other animals there. Absolutely. I do want to say hello to, oh, hold on. Let me make sure that we uh, get us back here on screen real quick. Hold on. Here we go. Okay, so that blank screen that you just saw right there, that's what it looks like without the, <laughs> the light on. I do want to say hello to everybody here. Um, we've got folks tuning in from all around. Maria's going to be back here soon. Hey, Diane from Livermore. Love my plankton assignment when I was at university. Love them. It's awesome. Oh, thanks, Jojo Southgate. We got Stockton, California in the house. Um, so question for you, Jane, is that, that we have there is what do plankton eat and what eats plankton? So ah, that's, that's an interesting question. That interesting is a question. fabulous question. And here at the lab, we have a beautiful illustration that I'd love to show you sometime um, showing that plankton is at the very base of the food web. The Plant plankton produces half the oxygen we breathe, and it is food for everyone. My friend likes to say, if you eat anything from the ocean, you're eating a belly full of sunshine, since oh, everything awesome. eats phytoplankton, and then the little animal plankton, you know, so it's it's truly everything eats plankton. Wow, yeah, and um, we should also mention that plankton is a lifestyle, so that ah. means that if you are a drifter, you're plankton. So you don't have to be small necessarily. So a jellyfish, a large moon jelly, might be plankton as well as its young, um, its young counterparts there. But Jane, we've got some, we've got some activity there behind us there on that on that microscope. Can you tell us who are these amazing drifters that we've Aren't got right there? Aren't they gorgeous? Can everyone see this? Yeah, we can see it there on, on the screen. Excellent. So these are, someone was asking earlier about growing our animals. And Ellen, our aquarist, did a fabulous job with our bat stars. And so the bat stars spawn and they unite in the water and form these larvae. And so we have two different stages of the sea star larvae swimming through this, um, it's kind of like the uh, dark, sky and uh, you can see the one over here on the is it your center uh -huh. has the orange in it that is its stomach and so it has been feeding like crazy uh, using the tiny little hair like structures they have on those little lobes they are creating a vortex wow. and pulling in the phytoplankton and then you can see look right into their bellies are we able to zoom in on that oh, yeah. a little bit here yeah let's let's see if we can get up nice and close here so again this is a bat star larva so um, we were mentioning that plankton is a lifestyle so if you're going with the flow you are plankton and if you eventually settle out from the plankton then you are what's known as a marrow plankter a marrow plankter being something like a bat star where we have this little bat star that's out there on the flow and then you have a uh, a, a time where it's just like, okay, time to settle out and you're no longer drifting there. And then if you're a hollow plankter, like say a jellyfish, uh, you, or uh, certain types of jellies, you might have your entire life adrift there on the, on the currents. So um, different ways of being plankton out there, same as there's different ways of being <laughs> a land animal. Um, so for you folks out there wondering what is plankton, it's a lot of different things and including this little bat star. And just for you folks out there who may not know what a bat star looks like, I'll just pull up this image real quick. That's what a bat star looks like. That's a teeny tiny baby bat star on the shore, but that's actually the adult version. We have right here the larva of that bat star there that Jane is expertly following around. These animals are moving. 
So just so you know, they are swimming through the water right now. That's why we have to move our little tray around. <laughs> and Jane, that, that swimming motion, that movement, that's allowing them to, to feed and also to, um, to kind of pick where they go in the water column, right? Absolutely. This one is really being active. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, off it goes. And um, so you can see that that mouth. Let's see if we can get that clearer. So the the mouth is that tube-like structure, and then you can see the stomach contents are the um, oh dear. Let's see the orange. Oh, you're there do, we you're go. doing amazing, by the way. We've got folks tuning in from Yay. from Modesto. We've got. Um, uh, Mitzi Maxwell there saying, um, Ooh, two. saying hello as well. Lincoln from New England. Oh my goodness, tuning in from the other coast. Um, so Ryan, yes, are jellyfish technically plankton? Yeah, they're drifters. They go with the flow there. So um, plankton again is a lifestyle. So if you have any friends out there that are drifting through life with no real direction, you can let them know that they are plankton. <laughs> Whether or not they settle out or not is completely up to them. There's no good or bad there. San Luis Obispo is there. Tascadero <laughs> is there. That's awesome. Okay, so Jane, now that we're looking a little bit closer here at, yes. at that bat star, you were, what, what was it that you were saying again? Sorry for interrupting, saying That's hello to the That's okay. Folks so this one, this one, can you see? I think you can. Yeah, we can point out. Yeah. Um, the one the one on the right that's just swimming oh, out. Oh, we'll hide us here. Out of view. Um, so on the is lower right. A little bit, yeah, a little bit later stage. Um, and so we have two different stages here. We have the beginning stage or first stage of the um, bat star. The, I won't bother with the name, but it is <laughs> the brachialaria. And so this one uh, to the right is a later stage and it's okay. getting ready to uh, form what's really cool. It's like uh, two fingers sticking out with little suction cups on them, and wow. they will attach to the seafloor when they are ready to settle. So it's swimming behind the logo right now for you folks that are watching on the stream. That's that a little bit more advanced bat star larva right there. That's right. Wow. And then you can see, you can really see the mouth. It's shaped like a flute and it is bringing in the uh, little phytoplankton at a nice rate because everything, you unfortunately, we can't see the tiny little cilia. Oh, but look at that. We can see the reflection of the cilia and we could see wow. a little bit of the movement uh, inside. Now here's two and you can see a little critter has just uh, swam inside the uh, brachialaria, the uh, bat star, star larvae. Um, so really cool. Wow, yeah, so for you folks that are watching, uh, a lot of people didn't know that bat stars came from larva out there on the, on the, on the waves, which is pretty incredible to think about. You know, we, we as humans, we have our, we have our babies one, uh, two, three, you know, maybe eight at a time if you're if you're on TV, but usually like one or one or two at a time if you're a twin. And then we take a long time taking care of that of that uh, child to raise them up to adulthood. And that's one way of raising offspring. But when these animals, they have this larval stage they're, they're kind of they're uh, as one might say, they're they're spraying and praying those broadcast spawners. They just put as many larvae as they can. Just they all spawn at the same time, and it all goes out, and they all eventually settle down. So completely different style of reproduction than you might expect from you know your dog, your cat, humans in your life. This is imagine if we as humans reproduce by having just larvae up in the atmosphere, and you could just stand there and look and like, oh, there go the Johnsons. Looks like they you know had a spawning <laughs> event, you know. So it's a very different very different life so a lot of people are you know how does one get this larva into a bat star it's pretty magical it really is and some of the uh, marrow plankton like patrick said those animals that send their larvae out into the wild into the uh, ocean and then they settle some uh, actually do have some parental care like the easter right. egg worm right. that, that holds her eggs until they reach you know mm -hmm. five segments and so some of them do hold on yeah, for a and little those, while those you're yeah you're reminding me the, the six raid stars in the tide pools. If you're Ooh, out there in the yes. tide pools and you see a sea star, a small little sea star, usually maybe an inch across, a little bit less, and it has six arms, those 
uh, will brood their eggs, same as uh, blood stars, I believe, will do that. So um, there is some parental care, and that is, uh, that is a way of maximizing the more of those eggs reach that adult stage instead of just putting them out there in the water. Um, I do want to make sure to go to the chat. On Facebook, we have a question here. Uh, what does a bat star larva of this size eat, and ah. how long does it take for the transition to occur from this, uh, from a larval stage to uh, a recognizable sea star? Oh, great question. Yeah. So that was something that we looked at closely when putting together this, uh, this lab. And it turns out that the first stage that we saw just a minute ago um, takes about four weeks, four to six weeks. Wow. And then the next stage, which we are looking at one right now that is transitioning to that um, next stage. You can see what looks like kind of a little flap coming out on the very top. And uh, so that will be in the water for another four to six weeks. So they can be usually about a month or two, um, but it can be as much as uh, three months depending on food supply and water temperature. And oh, they do awesome. feed on tiny little, mainly phytoplankton, but if the zooplankton or animal plankton are small enough, they'll feed on those as well. Well, that's great. Yeah. Well, uh, we've been streaming for about 20 minutes here, so I do want to say hello. Welcome, everyone, to the Monterey Bay Aquarium here live on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Periscope. We're all out there. Mm. Good morning from myself, Patrick. This is Jane. We've got Emily on the camera there behind the Yay. back, uh, making sure that we look good over here. And we are currently in an exhibit space at the, at the aquarium where you folks can actually come and talk to volunteer guides and staff looking at the plankton here. So we're uh, here before we open, and uh, it's really exciting to be able to share these live animals with uh, the online audience just as we can here with the folks that come and visit because these are animals that are live from the Monterey Bay. And you are live right now with Jane showing off amazing, Yay. amazing bat star larva that were grown here at the aquarium. Absolutely, and most of our plankton we do get from the bay with a plankton net, but we do have things like the bat stars that we're raising behind the scenes, Ellen is, and we have the moon jellies. Um, do we want to look at a moon jelly? Yeah, let's look at a moon jelly. Ooh. Let's do that. So we've got the bat star larva there behind us. Yes. And, and uh, we're, thank you everyone for, for watching, for tuning in. We've got folks from the Sierra Nevada mountains that are watching. Got folks from Europa Ooh. that are there. Yay. Oh my goodness, this is so cool. Here okay, get go. ready, everyone. We are gonna we are gonna go and take a look at yes, jellyfish larva. Here we go. Now that's probably not what most people would expect a jellyfish larva, or sorry, not a larva. What a jellyfish would look like when it is a baby, because these are the ones that bud off the uh, little baby jellies, and they came from larva. Apologies. You, you can explain it a little bit better than me. Go for it. So we got oh, polyps uh, here. We do. We have, uh, you know, jellies are pretty amazing. At least many of them have this alternate life cycle where they have the jelly stage, the medusa, and then they have the polyp stage. And what we're seeing right here are like little sea anemones. If you've seen a sea anemone, mm -hmm. and so they're part of the group Cnidaria where they have um, stinging cells. And it's so cool because these are being raised behind the scenes so that we have new ones for our exhibits. And you can see on the polyp that there are these strands that are stretching out on the bottom, well, they are producing new ones of themselves by cloning, asexual reproduction. And so it would be like if we could, you know, cut off our foot and our foot would become a new Jane or a new Patrick. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think that our parents would have been too appreciative of that if that were to happen. Uh, but again, these are those animals that reproduce by having as many animals as they can, as many um, versions of themselves out in the water column because a lot of them are not gonna make it and they're kind of, they're playing the odds there that some of them will make it to adulthood. So this is that polyp, as you were mentioning, like a little anemone. And it's hard to think that this will end up being a drifting mass of jellies like we have here in our in our um, all around this area here we're in the plankton 
uh, tiny drifters area, but around the corner from us is our famous uh, sea nettle chrysal, those big jellies that are going by. So those huge swarms of jellies come from very humble beginnings as little teeny tiny anemone looking animals somewhere on the seafloor, maybe on the face of a shrimp somewhere. Um, and so <laughs> do we do we have uh, a phyra is a question. Yes, um, here. yes, do yes, we yes. Have? So yeah, we let's do. And we'll look at them in just one sec. Okay. I just wanted to show one thing about these. Um, hopefully everyone can see that what I was talking about as far as the, uh, you know, cloning going on. And then let's just take a peek at a close-up of a tentacle, I mentioned that they, oh, have, they have stinging cells, and you can actually see, do you see those um, tiny little crystal-looking things? Yeah, if you can the see the bumps there on your screen, folks, uh, you might have to go full screen on your app. There we go, yeah, with a little bit of extra light. Yeah. If you look at those tentacles, they look lumpy and bumpy for a very uh, venomous reason. Absolutely. Oh, neat. So. Oh yeah, here. Hold on. Oop. Let me let me get you up. Let me get you up on the screen there, Jane. There you go. Okay. Point okay. it out. Okay. Point Woo! it out to the folks. So here you can see these little crystal-like things, and those are literally like capsules filled with stinging cells, and the cells are like a. I don't know, it's like a little balloon filled with a fishing line with a hook that is, you know, it's like a, um, a needle that goes into the victim and it gets sent, you know, like a hundred times the length of the uh, tentacle, of the, the width of that tentacle. So really cool. And it's great that they have, you know, species recognition for these jellies because if I go like this and show you how close they are, their tentacles are actually interacting. Um, you can't necessarily see them, but if I change the light a little bit, can you see that now where the tentacles are overlapping yeah, on each wow. other? Look at that. And that's because they will not sting another jelly of their own species. So I just think that's so neat. Um, jellies are one of the most simple animals. They don't have brains. They don't have discrete organs. Um, they are just one step up from a sponge. And so really basic. Wow. Well, and folks are just absolutely flabbergasted on the live stream here, Jane. We've got uh, folks saying this is so cool, Bren. Uh, Norado, thanks so much for watching. Uh, yeah, it is community week, so if you folks are part of uh, ah. San Benito, Santa Cruz, or Monterey County, uh, show up with some form of ID that shows your address in those counties, and like a bill or something, and uh, you can come on in and take a look at this plankton yourself. We've got a clinical lab scientist that is quite excited to see this. Hello from near Seattle. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, yeah, so this is... So those those polyps are incredible. Um, but we did have some folks out there that were saying a yes, are also absolutely. very cool. So and I'll say one last thing about yes, the go polyps. For it. Oh, which, see, which here's the thing with Jane is if you give her any in individual plankton, we're just going to go for hours. Hence why we wanted to do this live stream, because most people will be like plankton. Ah, I don't know. Jane, sit her down, grab what? some coffee, and we can go all day. Okay, yes, one more thing. But just one more thing. Yeah. That these, the, the Medusa, the jelly that you know and love, only lasts, what, maybe maybe a year or two, we're not sure, um, but definitely short-lived, whereas these can last 25 plus years. Wow. There's a there's an anemone in Scotland that's 200 years old. Wow, and yeah, Jane, actually that leads into a question that someone had. Uh, in your personal opinion, if these if these polyps can clone themselves and they can uh, bud off new versions, um, is that considered the same individual that's living the extra lifetime of all of those buds? Uh. Or would you consider each clone to be different? I'm, my understanding is it's pretty much up to your own interpretation. If you feel like they're, that DNA is going on forever, it's the same individual, they're living forever, or it's a backup copy of the organism and the original one is no longer around. How, how do you, where do you fall on that? Philosophically well, speaking. I, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to say. Yeah. I, I really, <laughs> ha to be honest, I haven't given it a lot of thought. Okay. Um, but I, to me, they are genetically identical. And so they would all be the same organism because um, just because one was the beginner, um, I think that eventually they're all the same. Okay. So, 
That's I think that's how I would. Well, call there you it. go. So that's your answer there. I think it's all about um, your preferred philosophy of it. But uh, right now we are looking at some baby moon jellies known as Ephyra. So you had those polyps that look like little anemones, and then they bud off these little jellies there. Oh, that's Ooh, beautiful. That's very cool. Look at that. You can see some of that. It still has a little bit of a top hat, that one does there. <laughs> I know. It's interesting. So the one on top is upside down or inside out, and the one uh, closest to the edge of the dish is what oh. we would term right side out. Y you know, the top of the bell is is on the top. <laughs> there, there you go. So you can see it there flapping now. Oh, and it just tucked itself in. Now, what's really incredible to me when I first saw a baby jelly, Jane, is that th they, they're they not perfectly circular. They they have little arms that are that ah. are sticking out um, and that those those apparently fill in later. So what are we looking at there, especially those beautiful glowing orbs at the end of those eight arms? You don't think of a jellyfish as having arms to it but they do when they're in this stage so what are we looking at there? yes so it's so cool the polyps that we looked at earlier um, at certain times a year with the right conditions will elongate and then there will be a stack of pancakes and those are the ephyra that they release uh, or these little babies mm -hmm. and so those bright yellow dots are the eye spot the balance organ and the chemosensory area that tell the jelly, you know, at when they're young and when they're old, you know, where things are and, you know, if they're coming up to a predator or prey and uh, if I'm going up towards the surface of the water or down towards the bottom. And it, they have an amazing name. You know, if you, if you follow jellies, especially moon jellies around a lot, there's a lot of really beautiful names you could use for for pets or children, depending on, on where you are. Uh, Ropalia is the name of those little sensory, Ropalium, Ropalia, plural, of those sensory structures. And we're looking at Aurelia, the moon jelly. So lots of really beautiful, um, I mean, very jelly appropriate names for these uh, majestic magic animals there. And it is, people are noticing, it's swimming, it's beating. How does that, how does that work? How, how is that? that swimming motion happening it's so only only patrick would think of naming his kids uh, the ropalia <laughs> oh yeah, yeah I, well. I, I think that could be a good one <laughs> i'll um, try i'll try we'll see we'll see if it sticks with a significant other i know so we can see um the beating and the neat thing about jellies is that even at this stage they have the very beginnings of what muscles are circular and longitudinal very basic muscles, just basically just twitching. And what they found is that when they grow, even like in a week from now, those arms or lappets that you see, uh, the eight arms, um, will fill in in between each of the arms. And um, then the muscles that are, you know, making them pulse actually draw food into them. So it's a really important part of their uh, feeding behavior as well as traveling along with the currents. Because yeah. they're plankton, they can't swim against the major currents, but they can swim up and down. Right. And um, what is this is a question. That's a little baby moon jelly that we're looking at. And that actually reminds me that I can bring up very quickly what we're looking at there. So this here is a moon jelly fully grown. They can be over a foot across, weigh several pounds, travel thousands of miles on the ocean currents, be incredibly, incredibly abundant out there. But they all start off very, very teeny tiny, just like these. And these are a great example of plankton of animals that are homegrown here at the aquarium. We want to say hi to Ellen as she walks by over off, hi, Ellen. off camera. Ellen is the amazing, amazing <laughs> uh, um, person who got all of the um, these samples. They're ready for us this early in the morning. So we thank you so much. We love Ellen. She oh, is Ellen's the fabulous. Best. Okay, here. Let me take this image of the bats of the moon jelly. Excuse me, moon jelly away. So we can look at the little baby there, there again, the Ephira swimming by. 
Yes, and so you can see um, in the center, there's these four little spots, and that's what's going to become where they digest their food and where they um, bring the eggs to, to fertilize them and then make a little larvae if it's a female. So there are separate sexes, the male and the female. Jane, do you know a, a gentleman named Edward Seidel? I do indeed. Okay, Is he he's, online? Well, he's saying that his son's name in utero was Melaby, like <laughs> the lion's mane nudibranch. So Ed and I are going to have a baby shower with those uh, scientific Ooh, names. High five. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Oh, we've got. Oh, Ed thank could you. tell us a lot about the jellies. Ed could as well. Yes. Uh, thank you for sharing. I dream of working with you at the Monterey Bay Aquarium someday of the tower honey well we can't wait to work for you someday here at the aquarium that'd be awesome hello everyone tuning in there on twitch we got jack ron there claire Fay is tuning in this is awesome thanks everyone um so jane we've got uh the the jellies there was there was there more that you wanted to point out about about the jellies otherwise we might transition to another organism i'm just looking at the time we got about eh, 20 minutes left before uh, the visitors come in. So Yes, I would love to show folks the little baby uh, periwinkle snail. Let's do it. Let's show All the periwinkle right. snails. Okay, everyone. Mm. And if you are just joining us, welcome everyone to the Monterey Bay Aquarium here live in our tiny drifters plankton lab. My name is Patrick. I work at the aquarium here in social media. We are joined by Jane, the extraordinaire uh, interpreter par excellence. And behind uh, the camera, we have Emily there making sure that she that things are looking sharp for hey, us there. Hey. Oh, there's there's Emily. There's there one of Emily's uh, appendages there sticking out there. Fantastic. Okay, let's see if we can get this. Let's see if we can zoom in. Uh, if you folks have any questions, feel free as well. Uh, just a reminder, if you are watching from the Tri-County area of the Monterey Bay Aquarium, whether that is Santa Cruz County, San Benito County or Monterey County, it is free for residents of those uh, locals there, uh, those local counties. So come on down to the aquarium with any sort of ID, uh, whether that's a bill or um, library card, something like that, come on down and uh, you can come and see these plankton for yourself. Okay. These are so tiny. Oh, Jane. These are okay. the tiniest we've ever had. We're gonna zoom in right here. Lab. Let's see. It's gonna be a quick view. Oh, look at that little face. Oh. See the eyes and the nose? <laughs> <laughs> look at it go. So uh, give us a bit of an orientation here on this periwinkle snail as it does little spins and circles for us there. Uh, you've got kind of a mass in the middle and then it looks like two little wings off the side. So what are we looking at there? So what we're seeing, you can see these beautiful colors. Those are the cilia that are reflecting or diffraction of the light from the microscope. And so you can see them whirling around in the little dish. Wow. And those are collecting phytoplankton. We have tiny little phytoplankton in the dish with them. And the two little eye spots are eye spots. The orange, um, main body is the shell it has already developed its shell it's a you know it's a thin one at this stage but these are periwinkles and so the coolest thing is that ellen contacted me when she found a little uh disc that was um had these red dots in it and she uh you know wasn't sure what they were and I was so excited because we used to find these um, in the water column and um, they are, they actually, the periwinkle snails lay an egg case and then these little uh, villagers, the first stage of a snail, pop out of them. Wow. And I am having a little trouble because they're so tiny. Let me. Oh, no worries. Uh, Jane, I'm gonna show the folks here what those periwinkle snails look like along the coast because there's a really good chance that you've seen those periwinkle snails. Uh, if you go to any of the intertidal areas around, that's what it looks like right there, is those periwinkle snails. Look like almost little pebbles caught in, the, in a little bowl there on the rock, but you're looking at a vertical rock face there. So uh, periwinkles are a very extreme organism that can deal with um, very, very dry conditions, very hot conditions. So for a marine intertidal organism, uh, those periwinkles are extremely hardy and extreme. And I know that the X Games are about to come up. If you had an X Games for plankton, 
uh, you're looking at some pretty, pretty incredible uh, ocean athletes there. So no worries, Jane, while you, while you look through that to find more, we want to say hello to everyone. Uh, we have uh, Sloan Cornelius, very excited about how cute that periwinkle uh, villager was. We've got Gaming with Marco 2019. Hello, thanks for um, tuning in. Ooh, this is a good question. I don't know. Uh, why are they called periwinkles? I, have, I do not know the etymology or where that may have come from. That's I a great question. It is a great question. I'm afraid I don't know either. Oh, it's right against the glass. I finally got it. But oh, oh, let's see. Oh, let's see. Jane is getting very excited here. I'll, I'll transition us to you. Can see, you can see Jane's plankton game face going on right now. Where it's her versus the medium. And something to really uh, point out to you about us moving this, this microscope around is that these animals are so small that they are effectively in a molasses of water. So it's very different from, uh, oh, almost there. Okay, oh, we can see it kind of swimming right there. Let's see, I'll get rid of us here on the. <laughs> oh dear, you know what? We may have to call it. We may have to call it. You know what? That's okay. Uh, like we were mentioning, Periwinkles are an incredibly extreme organism, and periwinkle versus nature, doing great. Periwinkle versus Jane and us on the live stream, one to the periwinkle right there. So, um, but these animals, they're in that water, and you can see how they, you can see how they jiggle back and forth. They are not flowing through the water just like we might if we were in a pool uh, where you sink into the water if you stop swimming. A lot of these animals are kind of suspended in that water like it's molasses or a thick ketchup. And so you can see them kind of jostling back and forth with the water as if the water uh, had all this tension inside of it. So when we look at these plankton, very, very different experience of being in the water than we uh, tend to have there. Yeah. Oh, okay. We've got we've got Emily with the periwinkle origin here. Let's get let's get this up on screen there. There is the periwinkle larva as they go around. For you folks out there tuning in, uh, this is from a petri dish. Uh, so these are living plankton here that were just uh, pulled out. Emily, give us the the origin there of uh, periwinkle. Uh, no, we cannot hear you. So just give it to me, and I'll I'll put it out there. comes from the Old English pinewinkle. Uh, which is probably from the Latin pina, which means muscle. Which is from the Latin pina, meaning muscle. And the second element, winkle, means corner or spiral. And oh, winkle, meaning corner or spiral. So muscle spiral. That makes a lot of sense. They've got a spiral shell. They've got that muscle there at the base. Thank you, Emily. Thanks so much. Oh, there we go. We got it. Yay. We got them. It's kind of that like was tiny flybys. Expert, expert level microscope work <laughs> there on the live stream. So you can see the periwinkle. We're not touching it anymore. We're not moving it. That periwinkle is doing its own thing there in the water. So tell us a little bit about it there, It Jane. sure is. And so you can see it, you know, moving the cilia around and it's moving through the water. It's kind of like a you know, cow grazing a grassy field because it's going through and capturing all the tiny little plant plankton. And every so often it will pull it in to its mouth. And so far I haven't seen this one do it, but the other day I was getting a delight out of watching them um, feed. And um, the spiral that uh, the name comes from, and muscle might even be that they live amongst the muscles, oh and they yeah. have a spiral shell. Um, but they also have, you know, as we can see, this uh, very effective way of moving through the water column. And they're only going to be in the water column as plankton for a couple of weeks, and then they'll settle down on the rocky shore. Oh, that is excellent. We've got a lot of folks saying thank you, Emily. Congrats, Jane. You did it great. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Kay Caffrell on a short break at work. Uh, looks like Marco came to the aquarium last Friday with the class. Thank you so much, Marco, oh, for nice. coming by. Yeah, another dimension to the world. Exactly, Sheila. Just seeing the world in these big, 
big ways and tiny ways, you look out at the, at the night sky and you see constellations that are light years away, billions of stars out there in the universe. And then you peer into inner space, away from outer space, into the ocean, and you're also finding constellations of baby sea stars, billions strong amidst a galaxy, a supernova of life there. So from the micro to the macro, uh, really incredible to see how different organisms work at different scales. And something you might recognize from the shore starts off its life as an inner space explorer going between continents, land masses, and then eventually settling on shore where you might be able to see it. Really incredible stuff. Um, they were very right to say, look from the tide pool to the stars, back to the tide pool. Again, you're Ooh, looking at- that's right. You're looking at that connection there to the galaxy, the big and the small. Okay. And, and the other thing to think about is that all of these animals are the very important part of the food web. We were looking at copepods earlier. They are the very base of the food web. There's the phytoplankton, plant plankton, and then come all these zooplankton. I'd love to show the mixed dish just to see. Let's what, do the mixed dish. We've got. We We've got maybe six minutes okay. left here before the public is here. Again, thank you everyone for tuning in here to the Monterey Bay Aquarium live all across the interwebs on Twitch, yeah. on Facebook, on Twitter, on Periscope, on YouTube. Thank you for being there. Thank you, Jane. Uh, this has been uh, excellent as, as always. We've got That's Emily great. there on the, on the camera. Ooh. Okay, Ooh. so the mix, yeah. so there explain, Jane, explain to us the mixed dish. This is just a free for all. Let's yeah, just, this is just, Straight from straight from the water. We have no idea what we're gonna be seeing. Oh, Let's man. see. Woo. Who do we got? Oh, we got the Bryce Owen. Yes, look at that little top we hat. The Bryce Owen, the Siphonotis larvae of our favorite Whoa. favorite Off Bryce Owen. <laughs> if you have ever been to a beach and you found a uh, kelp or seaweed covered with a white crust that looks like maybe dried salt, it's actually bryozoans cool little animals now bryozoan those are moss animals or yeah. carpet animals and it's hard to imagine that they start off life in this three-dimensional uh little hat swimming through the water this swimming swimming wedge there through the water and then they end up settling down and looking a little something like this so let me see if i can pull up that image Okay, so folks, if you've ever been to the beach and you found kelp that has this white crust growing on it, that's what we mean by bryozoan right there. So that is your that is your bryozoan look. Oh, and yeah. now we'll take this off, and then you'll see what that bryozoan looks like Oops. when it's a. Oh, who's oh. that swimming around? Yeah. So oh, I was gonna just see if I could find it. I think it. Uh, Oh, it's so. Oh, but this this is a really really cool animal. Yes. Um, called an amphipod. Are we able to zoom in oh, on yeah. it? Oh yeah. Uh, oh, never mind. <laughs> Off it went. <laughs> so amphipod, you might recognize if you were watching at the beginning of this stream, has that same ending as uh, copepod. There, amphipod and pod meaning. Um, uh, a type of foot typically. So um, we have many different types of things that you might call a shrimp and amphipods. There it goes. There's two different types of amphipods. Whoa. Oh, two fur. One is a gamarid amphipod, that one, and it is a really important food source for fish, for birds, for all kinds of things. And this one is Corophium. I can't believe it. I, I actually studied this in Elkhorn Slough. You study Corophium? What? I, I <laughs> wow. That's amazing. I know. Look at them go. Look at it go. So, yeah, the Meow. amphipods have different pods or different, um, you know, pinchers and different legs. And they are really abundant um, in certain areas, like Alaska, where the gray whales feed on them. Wow, Ooh, so, we, so we just saw some gray whale food. Yes, and so here we have a diatom that we're going to zoom in on. And here, I'm going to put us back up on the screen. Jane, uh, can we move us oh. over maybe just a little bit? Uh, Emily, I believe camera there will need to be. There we go. Awesome. Okay, here we are back. 
So we've got a diatom. Now, you folks out there may know diatoms. If you've ever had to deal with fleas and you use diatomaceous ah, earth, diatomaceous right. diatom, that would be um, the, the silica of these shells. They basically are uh, single-celled al algae that are living inside houses of glass there. And we've got a diatom there up on screen. Very important, very, very important plankton there. Absolutely. And this one um, has seen better days, unfortunately. Okay. It, it, oh. We're not able to see the beautiful glass silica because it has some little things growing on it. But we did have them for about three weeks that uh, Ellen collected in her toe. And they produce, what, 25% of all the oxygen that's yep. produced in the ocean. And they are one of the most important food sources for organisms out there. So if you were wondering, okay, what are these animal plankton feeding on at this stage of their life, diatoms are certainly up there along with cyanobacteria and other um, light consuming tiny, tiny, tiny algae and diatoms, crucial, very, very important animals out there. Uh, and who do we have here, so Jane? I see you ooing and eyeing, yeah. so let's Look see. Oh, yay. So we have a shrimp, and it could be an adult or a larvae. I'm not sure. There's so many different types of shrimp. I'm definitely not an expert on yep. identifying who, many so of who's, these. So who's doing the little uh, pirouettes there? Yeah, so this there is the, it looks kind of like a broken back shrimp, but I'm not sure. And um, and then up above is a worm. Wow. I, I'm known as the worm lover here and uh, <laughs> I always get excited when we find worms now uh, this would be a worm that maybe folks might recognize uh, if you heard the term a polychaete worm is that correct that's right yep. yes and many polychaete. segments sorry say that again <laughs> sorry yeah. um, they have many segments so poly many mm -hmm. and uh, keet meaning bristles yes yeah and so you can see I'll see if I can uh, get close up. I like that we both did bristles at the same time. You folks didn't see it, but we both did <laughs> bristles on the side there. Polychaete uh, worms there. Ooh. So you can see, if you look really close, there's two little red eyes. Oh, uh, oh yay. Oh, yeah, here. It's right up here. And then that's the tail end. And then the, the, the bristles... The bristles right are all around on each side, oh, and they have, you know, many segments. And so each segment has a. Uh, I, mo I moved it. I'm <laughs> the I'm the one I'm the one messing up everyone. There oh, we no, go. That's good. Now it's in a better place. Look at me go. Ooh, there we go. So uh, you know, some of the uh, polychaetes have uh, great faces. This one maybe not so much. <laughs> uh, and oh wait, who's that oh, on the lower left? We, we might recognize from before, right there. Oh yeah. Can front. anyone tell us what? just flew into the screen yeah you can see it going by it's got those two long antennae and one solitary red eye if you've been watching here for the last 52 minutes which good on you thank you uh, so much uh, uh, oh, you I might recognize oh look I at the know. worm sorry it it flew out of my view oh but look at this Oh, that is just beautiful. Look at that shrimp go by. Some of these shrimps are just magnificent. When you look, oh, you can see the heart beating. Can you see that? It right there behind the head. It might be able to see that. Oh, and here, sorry, if you zoom back out really quick, Jane, we had, there's our bryozoan larva. There it is. Yay. <laughs> awesome. At the end of the show, they're all coming out saying, look at me. Oh, that's awesome. Well, hey, um, I do need to transition us back to this front camera because there it, it's five minutes until we open, Jane. We want to make sure that we are ready for our guests from our, um, from our Tri-County community coming in here to come take a look at this plankton. Fantastic job, Jane. We're going to do this again very soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, uh, Jane, any, any parting thoughts on plankton for the folks out there? Thank you so much, uh, Patrick and Emily, for setting this up. I love uh, talking about plankton. Absolutely. But just, you know, that plankton is a way of life, as Patrick said. Anything can be plankton. I was plankton when I got caught in a rip current in Bolinas ah. when I was trying to, uh, trying to surf. And, uh, you know, so anything that's at the mercy of the major ocean currents, it can be a huge 100-foot siphonophore or these tiny microscopic ones. But they are the basis of the food web, everything we eat and breathe, you know, we depend on them. And microscopic 
uh, plastic is being found in the guts of these plankton. And so we really need to do a lot about um, getting legislation to ban plastics all around the country and the world. Yep, those single-use plastics shed little bits of themselves uh, and wind up in plankton space at plankton scale. So uh, if you're wondering, you know, you hear about microplastics, you hear about why we should use single-use plastic, what is, what is being affected? Well, those larvae of animals, those little, um, the little bryozoan larvae we saw flitting about, uh, the moon jelly of fire, those are those organisms that are being affected. So if you love those animals there along the shore, we have to love their plankton counterparts there too. And that's why uh, we are so thankful for all you folks out there being a part of that ocean-minded community, helping us inspire conservation of the ocean. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. We are going to sign off right now here. High five. All right. Yeah, Woo! we Thank did it. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks, everyone. We will see you again soon at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Thanks, everyone.